I'm Brendan, this is Joseph, and we're here for Harry's Heresy of a Curious Mind podcast, uh, where we explore some questions about religion with our expert here, best-selling author on Amazon with uh, three separate books. But today we're going to dive, we're going to work through one of his books called Heresy of a Curious Mind, which is where we get the name, um, and just some of the questions that he brings up there. So, Dad. Hi, Bren. Yeah. Good to see you again. Good to see you. <laughs> this is a great way to uh, have my son in my company again. So what we're going to cover today, I think, is uh, kind of like the framework of religion and specifically some of the odd things about Christianity and how it came about. Okay. So where do you want to begin? Um, well, I think you have a chapter called Framework of Christianity, right? So um, <clears throat> it talks about how... Religions are formed around other religions, usually, and uh, so where does that start? Uh, can we go there? <laughs> yeah, we can definitely go there. Yeah, so uh, uh, I guess the first thing we should say is we're, we're not trying to convert or unconvert anyone. Uh, we're, we're never saying that there's not a God. Uh, what we are saying is, I guess, that the evolution of our understanding uh, has, has changed, and, and there's a trajectory to it. Um, you know, the, the first men uh, or humans on earth were probably, they may have been actually monotheist because uh, God seems to be structured in the way our society is structured to a certain degree. So, uh, you know, the great spirit, uh, the sky god, the sun, whatever they were worshiping at the time. Um, but uh, where our story begins seems to be in the Canaanite community where uh, there was a pantheon at that point because uh, society had gotten to a point where you had specialists. You had, uh, like, think of Vulcan, uh, you right. know, that kind of thing, um, metalworking and fire and all of that. So so you had this pantheon in Canaan uh, at the time of, of El and his wife, uh, Ashtaroth, and uh, their, their sons, there were 70 of them, and one of them was Yah. Um, where we get Yahweh in, in the scriptures it says that uh, God divided uh, the nations uh, uh, and the sons of God took uh, each nation in the lot if you will the, you know like casting uh, dice the lot of Israel fell to uh, fell to Adonai or the Lord or Yahweh okay and uh, so um, we kind of see a trajectory from a Canaanite uh, deity and his wife into uh, who, who is called El, which is translated God in the Old Testament, to um, uh, Yah or Yahweh, which is translated Lord in the Old Testament. Okay. And, uh, so that's where we got to, to that point. And then, of course, from there we evolved into Christianity and from Christianity and Judaism sprang Islam, which is uh, kind of a combination of all of those and some paganism thrown in. Yeah, but that would that would be the youngest, I guess, major religion other than, unless you group in Scientology, right? Yeah, or mm -hmm. Mormonism. As, Mormonism, yeah, okay. Yeah, because that's a revelation too, isn't it? It's like you had the revelation of Jesus, and then you had the revelation of Joseph Smith. So the revelations continue to come, I guess, and probably will for the rest of eternity. Just another layer. Another layer, yeah. It's gotcha. kind of interesting. So, uh, what brought us from from all right? So we went monotheist to polytheist, and what it makes a lot of sense in the scripture where you see um, it talks about the God of Israel and the God of Abraham and all that. So mm -hmm. it makes sense that we started from a pantheon. Otherwise, I've always wondered why we would refer to it that way. You know. So what brought us back <clears throat> to thinking that the God of Israel is the one God, and we had to spread that? It's a great question, um, and I don't know that there's a a central answer uh, except that it's the way that the human uh, the human mind wants to work. We really want a hierarchy, and we really want one God, and and there should only be logically one Creator. The problem is that Marcion, for example, uh, who was a, a a New Testament, you know, hundred, hundred and fifty, hundred and ninety A.D. kind of guy. He's looking at this and he says, there could not be a single thing in common with the Old Testament God and the New Testament God. 
Because the Old Testament God was, well, he was uh, vindictive and, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, he, he was uh, bloodthirsty and he was full of war and pestilence and killing. And, you know, he, for example, sent uh, his people into uh, the, the area of the Philistines and said, kill them all. Yeah. Don't let anything breathe. And then you have the New Testament God uh, who Jesus uh is guiding us to, and, and he is full of grace and mercy and forgiveness. And uh, Marcion said, that can't be the same guy. So, uh, you know, even even back then in Jesus' time, you had this argument about really who and what was God. Makes sense. And with your argument, uh, you have another point in there that you make, I think, where you talk about the maturity of religions as like an adolescent to a young adult. Yeah, so... That the, Old Testament to New Testament right there. Yeah. It looks like yeah. that. It it does. So you, you take that same kind of immaturity and you can look at Islam. So you, you can say that, generally speaking, Judaism is, or I'm sorry, Christianity is 2,000 years old, whatever. And you can say that Islam is 1,400 years old. Now, this is just my theory. I'm just talking off the top of my head. But it just occurred to me that this, the same arc that you see in a human growth in years is seen in religion in hundreds of years. So Christianity is getting to a point where it's kind of maturing. We're taking a look back now. We're going, where should we be and all that. Islam is still a ranting and raving teenager at 14. And they're killing and, you know, they're, they're, their way is the only way. And there's no other way. And, you know, they know everything. And, and it just reminds me of a teenager whose butt should be whipped. And, uh, and that's where we were, right? At 13 and 14, we were doing the Crusades, and we were doing the same thing they were doing. And, you know, and we got our butt whipped. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's, it, it's a thing that occurred to me many years ago as I was studying religion, that this is a really weird arc, and it kind of mimics us. Yeah, I can definitely, I can see that for sure. Um, and you look at the other side of it, and you see... Buddhism or Buddhism and uh, Hinduism, the older ones, the older ones, more peaceful. You don't see a lot of. There's no war in the Middle East over Buddhism, you know. Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And you know, you can say that that's a difference in teaching, but it really isn't because if you look at the teaching of Jesus and look at the teaching of uh, Buddha, uh, they have so much in common in, in peace and forgiveness, and yeah. you know, just just let it go, seek God, love your neighbor. You know, and uh, there's a lot of similarities in, in the actual teaching of the teachers themselves, not in the right in the extrapolation not of the doctrine. Maybe. Right. Yeah. I can. Yeah, that makes sense. So. So what's our next step, I guess? Oh, gosh. How does Islam enter into young adulthood? Well. Islam went through a period of, of peace and growth, and they brought us all kinds of things, all, all you know, sciences and different things. And, but to answer your question, and again, this is probably going to rub some people the wrong way, but uh, I think we need to get over religion and get back to uh, spirituality, you know. And, and I'm a, a, a mystic, as you know. I don't believe in doctrine as much as I do in uh, personally chasing uh, God himself or herself or itself or whatever. Just, In other words, um, doctrine, as they say, is like glass. You can see the truth through it, but you can't touch the truth because it keeps you from it because it has limitations. Right. So to answer your question, there was this interesting evolution of mankind that lasted about 800 years, and it started around the time that Buddha was born and ended about the time that Jesus was born. And it's called the Axial Age. And so you had this, these religions that were all intent on uh, sacrifice. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and each religion had kind of like its, its own way of sacrifice. And then one day, all of these great people, Latsu and Buddha, and uh, all of these people began to to show up. In, in they were born and and they they begat the religions Zoroaster and all of these people. 
all these great minds at one time. Uh, and, and seemingly within just a few hundred years, uh, the world had changed from an external, sacrificial, bloodletting, uh, you know, pretty, pretty barbaric religion, trying to figure out what God wanted, and he always seemed to want to kill something, to this kind of internal religion where we were seeking the heart of God. You know, Jesus uh, really taught just that. Seek God, love your neighbor. You know, all of these people were teaching the same thing, and it was all internalization. Right. Um, and But our problem as humans is, uh, for example, look at Buddhism. You know, Buddha said, I'm not a god. I'm a guy who just woke up. And what did they say? That's just miraculous. He's He's so humble. He's so humble, he must be a god. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you you have this problem in humanity. And um, so where do we go from here? We, we get over that, and we realize that we all just need to wake up, and we all just need to follow this really simple little formula of uh, um, tracking ourselves internally, finding our source, and uh, and developing it, developing the creation you know, we need to watch the words because those ancient words have ancient meanings. We are inspired. And all that means is that we've been breathed into by God. So we need to find our inspiration. I like that. Yeah. It's very, uh, uh, very feel good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how would you, I guess, how would you pass that down? You know, so like you make breakthroughs within yourself. Um, a lot of the doctrine we codify just so we can pass it down, right? Right. How will we pass down that spirituality? Well, here's the problem. Uh, your great-grandfather used to tell me all the time, just because you get saved in a rose bed, don't drag everybody into that rose bush because all they're going to get is pricked. Mm -hmm. They're not going to get saved because everyone has their own path. Now, he, he was a great teacher. He was, uh, as you know, a... Uh, he was a charismatic preacher, but he had a lot of good common sense. And so uh, it is a very individual thing. Um, we need to go, I think we need to look at our doctrine and how it has moved. And then kind of like we will understand where we're going if we've understood where we've been. So if you, uh, if, if you look at how, for example, the Apostles' Creed, has evolved over the last you know few hundred years <clears throat> when it was first written you see this uh this evolution as it becomes bigger and bigger and tighter and tighter and more and more legal um because what they're doing is they're chasing heresies um see a law is not written or a doctrine is not written unless there is someone breaking that law or announcing a heresy and then you have to go back to the law and you have to tweak it to get rid of that that loophole so um here's a one of our books it's uh let's see okay so this one is called the Hi history of god and it just covers elohim yahweh and, and uh allah so um constantine calls a great synod so we, we have this meeting, and he's saying, you guys have better get your act together because Christianity is fragmenting because this guy believes that Jesus is God. This guy believes he's man. This guy believes he's all things all time. And you have all this, you know. So um, the doctrine of the Trinity of merchants, right? But it really doesn't. That's what people don't get. It's like they, we accept the Trinity because we've been taught the Trinity. But let me read you a couple of things. This is, this is okay. interesting. This is a quote from Eusebius, who was uh, one of the great, uh, we'll call him doctors of the church at the time of Constantine. So he's, he's gone home now, and he's away from Constantine's view. And the doctrine of the Trinity has, has been written out. And then Eusebius gets home and he writes the king, or actually the emperor Constantine. He says... Okay. We are committed, we have committed an impious act, O Prince, wrote 
Eusebius of uh, Nicodema, by subscribing to a blasphemy from fear of you. And another guy says, uh, goes on to explain that the language of the debate on the consubstantiality uh, of uh, the Father and the Son has made many people think that the Church of Nicaea has abandoned the general doctrine of Christianity, which was religious through and through in order to embrace some sort of Hellenistic ontology. Um, in other words, they didn't believe in the Trinity, but it's been pushed on us because it makes us walk in lockstep. Right. So, and that's what he wanted, right? He wanted yeah. to control. So he needed everybody going in the same direction. Mm -hmm. So the people that he couldn't bring under that umbrella, he kicked out. He, he basically said, you got to leave my kingdom. And he objected them. And so it left this core of Christianity with this doctrine that nobody really understood and nobody really agreed with. But when they went back home and they were forced to explain it, they said, it's a great mystery. It's a great mystery. <laughs> so it's sort of a forced compromise, I guess, where nobody won. That's, that's interesting. Now we, a lot of uh, denominations use that as like the core of, you know, their entire sermons. Right. So, um, and, and I think that's the point. Uh, we need to kind of get away from this doctrinal um, uh crunch that we're in and um, now it, it's not that I'm saying that everything goes what I'm saying is uh, we're in a straitjacket and part of where we need to go in Christianity is to get out of the straitjacket and say we don't know we're going to seek God but more importantly I know that you don't know and you know that I don't know and so in the words of Ram Das, really all we're doing is walking each other home. And if we can get to that point, I really think the world would be in a better place. Yeah, I would agree. It'd be a place of community instead of just arguing over doctrine. But just play devil's advocate here. How do you how would you draw somebody into um, that religion? You know, it's not very it's not as touchy feely, you know, warm, tingly kind of feelings if you say, I have no idea, but you know, we're both gonna try. Yeah, yeah. Um boy. That that really is the core of the human issue is that we love laws and rules and regulations because we know that we're on the right path if we follow all these rules. Right. And when you throw the rules away, you, you really don't know if you're on the right path or not. Well, we don't know anyway. Yeah, it's an <laughs> illusion, right? <laughs> it's an illusion. Um, you know, I, I hear a lot of our, our Christian brethren say, if you just believe in Jesus, you'll be saved. If you believe that he's the Son of God and, and that he died for our sins. Well, that brings up another problem because there's this arc, this, this evolution that happens over a period of about a hundred years. Mark is written about 30 years after Jesus is dead. That's an entire generation, practically. I mean, yeah, definitely in that time. Yeah. yeah I mean, uh, the Lumpkin generations are about 20 years from child to child to child. Yeah. Um, and so <clears throat> it's, you know, this is another generation. And then you end up with the book of John, which is written about 90 to 100 years uh, after Jesus' death. Um, or I should more, be more specific, 90 to 100 years AD. Uh, Mark has nowhere in it that Jesus is divine and the virgin birth doesn't exist. Now, why is that? Well, at that particular time, you still had the uh, Ebionite church that was alive and well, and it was controlled by James, who was the brother of Jesus. Right. And now, how are you going to tell the brother of Jesus that his mother's a virgin? Yeah. I mean, come on, you know. 
So, but, but after that denomination began to, uh, or sect began to kind of wane and Paul took over by bringing in all of the uh, pagans, you had Luke where Jesus is born of a virgin fathered by the Holy Spirit. And then you end up with John where Jesus has always been with God. Now, uh, Matthew and Luke, they, they kind of go hand in hand and a voice comes down from heaven when Jesus is baptized and says, this is my beloved son today, I have begotten you. That's a whole different issue. That's a, a real problem with some people because if Jesus was begotten that particular day, like God says, then the fact that he was always with God, according to John, becomes a real issue. Right. So there are people that are fighting about that. Did he did he become did Jesus become Christ at his baptism, or was he born that way? Well, John continues the evolution and says Jesus was always with God, and is um, you know, and then you get into a problem of uh, the Trinity after that, where they're equal. They're of the same substance. But then you have Jesus hanging on the cross going, Eli, Eli, lava sabachthani, you know, my, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yet in another translation of that, that was probably doctored by the Gnostics, he says, uh, my power, my power, why have you forsaken me? So they believe that the Holy Spirit departed from him at the time of his crucifixion. So you have all of these different uh, sects going on, fighting on what really has, is going on, because nobody really, looking, looking back on it, nobody really could figure out what Jesus was. But the people who were with him at the time did not believe he was God. They believed he was Messiah, which is anointed and appointed. Right. So a major prophet. Right? Yeah, major prophet. And the oldest of those is Mark, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it looks like Mark was used by Matthew and Luke, and they just added their stuff to it. Right, embellished, embellished, and then John embellished again. Yeah, John comes uh, kind of like from a, a different um, uh, original text, and embellished, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah so. And then Paul, of course, never met Jesus, but walked in in the middle of all of this, probably about 50 years afterwards, and said, I've got a vision, so I know him better than you do. And he's talking to his own brother at that point, Jesus' his own brother. And um, if the church had stayed where Jesus left it and where James left it, it would be a Jewish sect. Because all Jesus was trying to do was say, look, the end is coming. You better get ready and stop being Sadducees and Pharisees and start you know, being good, godly people. Right. Paul opened it all up to, uh, to the pagans. Well, in the days of James, they were meeting in synagogues because they were Jewish. They just thought that Jesus was the Messiah. By the time Paul gets through with it, you can't have pagans in synagogues, so they had uh, home meetings, and when they outgrew those, they had churches. So you have an evolution there. Okay. So what was pagan that they couldn't bring into the synagogue? Oh, you just you can't have people who aren't Jewish in synagogues. You have to be right. uh, Jewish, circumcised, follow so the So when law. we quit, okay, I got you. When we start bringing in Gentiles, and no more synagogue. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> synagogues, Gentiles, they don't go together. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh. So, um... There's, I've heard that there's um, certain people that think that Jesus, and I'll, I'm not even sure where this came from, I, you'll have to tell me the gospel, but um, Jesus didn't do much in his teen years or early years until he's baptized, right? right. That's one of the beliefs you were just talking about. And I've heard something about they thought that he was actually kind of a misbehaved kid. Have you heard no, yeah, about well, that? yeah, so... <clears throat> um, um, we actually have a book out about this. Uh, I've tried to cover about everything in, in the Christian history. 
So uh, the infancy gospel, um, I think the, the book is called Jesus from birth to adulthood or something. But, um, the infancy gospels, which are, I guess I, sh I should frame this, right? Um, around 200 AD, you're sitting around talking about Jesus. And your, your parents and, and your, your kids are playing and they're misbehaving and they're two, three, five years old and they're just little hellions. And you go, I wonder what it was like to raise God. What, what would Jesus have been like if he had had his power? And then they started spinning these stories and they wrote them down. And they're really pretty cool. Um, Jesus was a real brat. Um, <laughs> One in, in one scenario, he's uh, the, the teacher's teaching him the alphabet, and uh, Jesus tells him that he will tell him the alphabet if he can tell him what the alphabet means. Now, what he's actually saying is that um, the Paleo Hebrew was kind of a hieroglyphic language, and it actually had you know certain meanings of each letter. And uh, like bait is a house, it's a door, and it's a house. It's second letter. Uh, Gimel is a camel, and it has you know it, it has certain meanings. So it's kind of looking at it from that perspective. Well, uh, the headmaster says, you know, you're a brat, and I'm going to whip you. So he draws back to spank him, and Jesus withers his hand. <laughs> so you have things like that. Uh, one time, uh, uh, a, uh, a playmate of Jesus, they're where they're not supposed to be. They're on the top of a house. Uh, of course, houses are flat, so they're, if they're playing on the roof, the guy falls off. His friend falls off. Because he's such a brat, they come running, the parents come running, and they go, well, Jesus pushed him off. He's just that kind of a, a brat. And Jesus says, no, I didn't. Well, yes, you did. Well, I'll prove it. So he calls the guy back from death. Yeah. He says, hey, did I push you off? He went, no. Okay, get up. <laughs> <laughs> so it's so, stories like that. Yeah, it almost sounds like Harry Potter or something. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and there are a lot of Gospels like that that we, of course, have not, you know, we throw them out because they're they're really entertaining. But, but what they do is they don't teach you what the truth is. They teach you what people are thinking at the time. That's how you have to look at it. It's like, what was on their mind? What was going through their heads? How were they thinking about religion and Christianity at that time? That's the way you have to approach it. Okay, that makes sense. So, were those, those were never, I hope those were never considered gospel. They were like never that. considered. <laughs> okay. They were never up for canon. Okay. Not, for, not for a moment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> at least we had some sense. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Now there were people. There were uh, books that were up for canon that, uh, like uh, the Apocalypse of Peter, was up for canon. And uh, there's actually lists that have that particular book instead of the Apocalypse of John, which we call Revelation. Okay. Um, apocalypse simply means to reveal. Or we Latinize it and get the word Revelation. So, uh, and it's an interesting book. It's um, that one looks like. Dante's Inferno turned on its head. Uh, it, it really may have been actually where Dante pulled some of his literature from because it gives a brief overview of heaven. The problem with heaven is how, how, how many ways can you describe bliss? Not really very many. So what you say about heaven is like everybody's happy and we're there and God's there and we're, everybody's happy. Yeah. <laughs> But you can elaborate until the callous come home about hell. So in this particular gospel uh, or revelation, you have um, women who, who braid their hair to make themselves look pretty to get men hanging over hell by their hair. You have adulterous males hanging by other things over hell's fire. And it's things like that. That's so not very daunting. <laughs> yeah, it does. And I, I'm... I'm kind of convinced that he stole that. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, the punishment fits the sin, right? Right. That was his whole thing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, how many how many levels are there? And I don't recall. Um, yeah, I, I'd have to read it again. It's um, I'm old and it blurs. You know, maybe we'll come back to that one day. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, it would be an interesting book to explore. It would. Okay. So you think we're gone, done for right now? And yeah. We come back later? Yeah, I'm okay. good with it. Are you? I'm good with it. Why don't you get us out of here? All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks for tuning in this week. Um, next week, I guess we'll probably cover the Apocalypse of Peter. And uh, we have something special this weekend where for some medieval times, we're going to cover some content on the Black Plague. So tune in, uh, like, subscribe, follow. Thanks again. Thank you. <laughs>